Good morning. We are so glad that you are here with us in worship today, and I have a few announcements for you. Today at 10 a.m., um, Mr. Dan will be meeting with the youth and parents to talk about the upcoming youth year. It will be downstairs during sun the Sunday school hour. Pickleball today will be happening at 2.30 um, as normal, Tuesday and Friday at their normal times as well. This week, the men's breakfast Bible study will continue to meet on Tuesday at 6.30 a.m. at Skip's. And this week, the women's daytime study will resume on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. in the hearth room. Our Wednesday night midweek programs are back. We met back last week um, with our backpack blessing, and it was a good service and meal and a good time. And if you know someone that wanted a backpack tag that didn't get one, just let us know, and we will be happy to get them one. Um, but we will start back again this week. Um, we will have our meal on Wednesday night at 5 o'clock, and then all of our classes start back this week. Our youth and children and adult classes will all start back. Um, so we hope that you'll come and join us. Um, our mini campers, our little kiddos, were at um, Crystal Springs yesterday, and they had a great time. And so um, maybe if you see one of them, you could ask them about it. They had a good time. Um, but I think that's all of our announcements. Um, we're glad you're here. Glad you're with us. Good morning. Would you please stand and let's sing together our hymn of greeting number 78, I Love You, Lord. As the music continues, turn, welcome your neighbor to church today. Would you join me in our responsive call to worship as it is found in the bulletin? God lifts us from death to life and preserves us for God's purpose through the compassion of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. With thanksgiving, praise the Lord. Would you pray with me our invocation? Jesus, you walk on the waters of turmoil to meet us in the midst of your purposed journey for our lives. Help us to recognize your presence, remember your promise, rely on your power, and receive your peace through every storm. Amen. Our hymn number 87, Fairest Lord Jesus. You may be seated. As we pre prepare to confess our sins together, hear this our call to confession. Let us confess our sins to the Lord of all, who is generous to all who call upon him. Would you pray with me our confession? Gracious God, you call us to step out in faith, trusting you for all things. We respond to your command, but then sink in doubt and fear. Forgive us, we pray, when we confess with our lips, but do not believe in our hearts. Help us to practice our faith in all circumstances. Lift us out of sin into the arms of your mercy. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is Lord. God raised him from the dead, and we are saved through him. This is the good news we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's join together as we sing a shelter in the time of storm at 693. my rock in him we hide a shelter in the time of storm secure whatever in the tide a shelter in the time of storm oh jesus is a rock in a weary land a weary land a weary land oh jesus is a rock in a weary land 
shelter in the climb of storm, a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears, alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. I'd like to share with you a few prayer concerns this morning. Um, we want to extend our sympathy to the family of Race Kennedy, who passed away this past week, and also to the family of Patsy Tressel, who also passed away this past week. We want to remember those that continue to be in the hospital or were recently in the hospital. George King had a successful hip replacement surgery this past week. Easton Taylor, who is a seven-year-old, he is at St. Jude right now, receiving treat treatment for lymph lymphoblastic leukemia. We want to continue to remember Kevin Grant, who is still in Mont Eagle. Zach and Miranda Womack and their baby Sutton is still at Centennial. And Della McKinney, who is in uh, the skilled care unit at the hospital. Um, we also have many who are recovering from lots of different things. Diane Hickman, Reverend Charles Hughes, Kathy Craig, Gary Mumma, Matthew Ratcliffe, Lynn Almacher, Arlene Basham, Shadow Simmons, Bobby Spencer, and Irene Hill asked for a prayer. She's not been feeling well. Um, we also want to continue to lift up our our friends and family who are dealing with cancer and in and, and treatments. We want to continue to pray for Pat Smith, Kevin Seiler, Laura Arnold, Don Gibson, Debbie Bloomfield, Pam Peck, and others. Are there any others that you would like to lift up this morning? Then let's go to God in prayer. God, you have called us to be a people of prayer, to continue the ministry of intercession handed on to us by Jesus himself. And so we come before you with confidence, bringing our prayers for the world, the world you love. In your mercy, hear and answer. We pray for those who, like Jesus' disciples, find themselves surrounded by high winds and stormy seas, those who feel overwhelmed by events and circumstances, the loss of a job, the death of a loved one, serious accident or illness, chronic pain, depression, or divorce, and who don't know where to turn. We pray for those who, like Joseph, find themselves deeply wounded by the people they love, people they thought they knew and trusted, and who are struggling to know how to respond. We pray for those who, like Peter, are experiencing a crisis of faith, who long to wholeheartedly trust in God but are held back by questions and doubts. We pray for those who, like the prophet Elijah, have fallen into despair, who have begun to doubt God's presence and power or question God's call in their lives. 
We pray for those who, like Joseph, have had their hopes and dreams crushed, those whose lives have suddenly taken a different turn and who now wonder what lies ahead for them. Loving God, it is not your will that any should suffer. We offer our prayers for all those who hunger and thirst, those who live in the midst of violence or poverty, and those who feel abandoned or ignored by the world around them. Through the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit, make your sustaining presence known to all who are in pain or need, so that they too may know your love and live. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture comes to us today from the Gospel of Matthew in the 14th chapter, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and crying out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was reading an article on the Kennedy Center webpage entitled, The Skeleton of a Scary Story, and it says this, At their heart, scary stories share the qualities of any other story, including a main character with a goal and obstacles standing in that person's way. But they have several additional factors, a scary setting, creepy characters, and a twist or an uh uh-oh moment. So let's say we're writing about Susie, a girl who wants to get home but can't find her way. In a non-scary story, Susie struggles to read her map, tries in vain to find someone who can help, and wanders for hours before finally making it home. But in a scary story, Susie is lost on a rocky, crab-filled seashore at midnight, She does find someone who offers to help, but it's a ragged hitchhiker with a claw hand. And just when Susie thinks she's found her way, the hitchhiker reveals a secret. Thirty years ago, he too got lost on the shore, and he's been wandering ever since. Our scripture passage from this morning is a scary story. It may not seem like it. We've heard it a lot of times. And so it takes some of the the scary out when we've heard it again and again. But maybe this retelling will help you see the scary behind the story. It's 3 a.m. and the clouds rolling in have hidden the moon. And on the sea, a small creaky boat is buffeted all around by the wind that's been pummeling it for hours. The boat is so far out to sea that no shore can be seen, nor any light to guide its way. The little boat is stuck, 
trapped on this sea for who knows how long. Twelve men have been bracing themselves for hours trying to row but making no progress. They're getting frustrated and tired and can't see an end to their misery. Then one of the men sees something in the distance. What on earth could it be? It's too small to be another boat, and it seems to be glowing. As it keeps coming towards them, the rest of the men begin to see, and they are terrified. The only thing that the, these men can think is that it's a ghost. They tremble and cry out in fear as the ghost keeps coming for them. Then they hear a voice piercing the darkness. Take heart. I am. Don't be afraid. Of course, we know the person walking on the water is Jesus. But the disciples don't know that. And you can maybe start to imagine how scary this situation would have been for them. And the disciples didn't know it was Jesus until he speaks to them. And with the implication from Jesus' statement, it may seem like a, a little statement there. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am. But it has some serious implications. And I think the disciples took it seriously, and maybe the statement even scared them a little bit. And it should scare us more than the thought of a ghost walking to them on the water, because it's a big, bold statement if you really think about it. Jesus is claiming to be God. In the first century ancient world, Ghost stories were as common as they are today. Ghost stories from this time had some normal characteristics. And it's very interesting that when the disciples see Jesus, when they call him a ghost, um, it's interesting because this story doesn't exactly sound like other ghost stories that they would have known and heard. In ancient texts, um, there is no... Um, known literature that, that shows or describes ghosts as glowing because they didn't have things that glowed. In fact, ghosts can only be seen when there is a minimal amount of light, usually by the aid of a fire. And in their literature, too much light would cause them to disappear. And during the time of the disciples, there's not one example of any ancient ghost story that depicts ghosts walking on water. In fact, if they did go out into the water, in the stories, that's their end. They are no more if they, they reach water. Water acted as a boundary that was impossible for ghosts to cross. So, if the disciples know that ghosts can't walk on water, um, they know that ghosts don't glow, they know, they know all of these things, then why... Do they assume that this, whatever it is, coming towards them on the water is a ghost? And this is where it gets interesting to me and maybe interesting to you. Do you want to know who in ancient literature walked on water? Any guesses this morning? Gods. Gods were known in stories to walk on water there's no shortage of examples that describe divine men and gods walking on water. So Matthew, in his choice, is highlighting the deity of Jesus and the disciples' lack of understanding. Dr. Jason Combs says that gods and divine men walk on water, ghosts do not. But when the disciples see Jesus walking on the water, they believe the impossible rather than the obvious. The disciples' first reaction was to believe the absurd that this was a ghost instead of believing that Jesus might actually be God. This passage is screaming at us that Jesus is God 
And it may not look like it from a first reading, but when you start digging in the terms that Matthew uses, the way he talks about it is trying to tell us who Jesus is. And at the end of this passage, the disciples will have gone from Jesus is a rabbi, a good teacher, to believing that he is the Son of God. So, for instance, let's look at what Jesus says to the disciples when they are in the boat, terrified, and he is still out on the water. He says, take heart. I am. Don't be afraid. Anyone else recognize a part of Jesus' statement that you may have heard? Maybe somewhere back in the Old Testament, um, there was a guy named Moses that you may have heard of, and he has... A talk with God in front of a burning bush. Who does God say he is? I am. Ian Russell Jones says that Jesus is using the divine name to announce his presence. I am is here, trampling victoriously over the waves. And in these brief but charged words and in the awesome vision that unfolds before the disciples, Jesus is identifying himself with God, the liberator and redeemer of Israel, who is at the same time the creator of the world and the victor over chaos. His words, instilling courage and banishing fear, assured the disciples that this awesome vision in the midst of the wind and waves is intended to be good news. The unveiling of God's majesty is not intended to terrorize or diminish, but to save and uphold and establish. We live in a world that's chaotic, don't we? And the disciples lived in a world that was chaotic. In the Old Testament, water, and especially the sea, represents the forces of chaos. In the Bible, the sea is always a threatening thing. And as one commentary put it, it represents all the anxieties and dark powers that threaten, us, threaten the goodness of the created order. To be at sea evokes images of death, the active power that threatens the goodness of life. And in the midst of the chaos of the world, the disciples are left alone in the boat. Jesus is reassuring, I am often seems at odds with the chaotic world that we all inhabit. So Jesus' claims that he is God and that he is with us, sometimes to us fall, um, they feel false and hollow and meaningless. Many of us would love to have an experience like the disciples had in this story to back up the claims that Jesus is making and that Matthew is making and that the Bible is making. We would really love to have this spectacular reassurance. If we can believe that Jesus walked on the water, if we can believe Jesus when he says he is I am, he is God's presence among us, then this story should not be scary at all. It should be the best news possible. But so I guess the, the question comes down to, is Jesus really God? Do we believe the authority of the Bible, the witness that Matthew and the other writers of the New Testament wrote down for us? Matthew sets out to show us that Jesus was the long-awaited Jewish Messiah and he does a pretty, go pretty good job in this story building his case and showing us how Jesus acted in ways that only God acts. So if our answer is yes, and I hope yours is yes this morning, then how does that impact our lives? There is the obvious Sunday school answer that Jesus is the Messiah sent by God to save us from our sins. And yes, that is a great thing. But what does this really mean in day in and day out in my life? Jane Lim talks about how in her life, she's always aware of this emotional and spiritual thirst, this need for affirmation and affection and control. See, she wants to know that she's doing the right thing and that things will be okay. 
And I think we can relate to that. She says that whatever she manages to accomplish, though, never feels like enough. And until Jesus brings her back to the living water again and again, Jesus' words and actions remind us through rebukes and comfort and encouragement that all the efforts that we make have not been and never will be enough. But by knowing Jesus and believing in him, he takes control of our lives and what he has done for us will last forever. What Jesus promises us, he will make happen. It also means for me that when we face the darkness, whatever that may be in our lives, if we believe Jesus is God and he is the son of the God of all creation, the one who holds all of this together, then we can rest in the knowledge that he will also take care of us. I went through a dark time of depression before we moved here to Winchester and I struggled with questions about God and if he was real, if I could believe and ultimately trust what I've read about him, if his promises were true. And a lot of those questions um, spiraled on my mortality. I spent many a day in fear, but for some reason, I was always able to pray. I always went back there no matter how many times I doubted and questioned. Jesus was able to step into my life in small moments of hope and comfort that gave me little lights to guide my way until I found myself out of the darkness. Now, sometimes those fears creep back in and those doubts follow me, but I have found that if I can remember what Jesus has done for me, if I can focus on the promises that he made, and if I can recall the things that Jesus has done throughout history, then I can settle down and trust in Jesus. Because if Jesus is who he says he is, then he's got this and he's got me. And I think also the, the other biggest way that believing Jesus is God impacts our lives is through his word. Jesus' words and his story are what anchor and guide us. And without knowing who Jesus is and who he says he is and who others say he is in the Bible, we are bound to be confused and lost. Because circumstances change, everything can change. But if we have his word and we have the church, we can continue to see clearly when our own understandings fail. Lim continues saying, knowing who Jesus is to me gives me the strength to get up and face each day, knowing that he has saved me and continues to save me every day from the pit of self-pity, fear, and despair. If I tr truly trust that Jesus satisfies and gives me peace, I can go ahead and do what is in front of me. I can choose to be faithful in the smallest things. And my satisfaction and security will not depend on a favorable outcome, but on Jesus and what his word says about who I am. So this question is a big question. Do we really believe Jesus is God? The story in our scripture passage isn't over yet, though. Jesus isn't done showing us who he is. And y'all know I love Peter. I hope you love Peter, too. I've talked about him many times before. But Peter doesn't think before he acts. And it gets him into all kinds of trouble. But it also, he experiences things with Jesus that nobody else gets to. So today, Peter is in the boat, being knocked around and miserable. And he, along with all the others, is terrified when they think they see a ghost. Jesus calls out to them, declaring that he is God and to not be afraid. And Peter, in all of his recklessness, dares to test Jesus' identity. If it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. This moment really shows that Peter did, I think, have a ton of faith and trust in Jesus. He knew, just like us, that people don't walk on the water. But he also trusted immensely in who Jesus said he was. 
I would love to know, like, if he immediately, like, jumped right out of that boat and got to walking on the water, or if he, like, hesitantly put his legs over the side praying that he wouldn't sink. This couldn't have been an easy task either. The wind is still blowing. They're still being rocked on the waves. Was he thinking in his head, this is crazy. Why am I doing this? I can't do this. But amazingly, he gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. And we don't know how many steps he took, but Peter gets distracted. And his attention is drawn from Jesus to the waves that crash around him. And it's when Peter looks around, when he notices the wind, that the fear of the situation, um, it's gotten to him. And it takes over and it diminishes his faith in who Jesus is and what he can do. And Peter cries out, Lord, save me, before he goes under the water. And I want you to hear this this morning because Jesus immediately reaches out and catches his hand and pulls him back up. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Why do we doubt? Doc Hollingsworth says that Peter stepped towards Jesus because of an informed trust. Jesus had never failed him. Still, the strong wind scared him. His risk, however, created a deeper trust in the steadfast grace that continues to save. This moment is a reminder that courage and anxiety... Hearing the word of God and facing the winds and chaos of trust and doubt, they're always a part of Christian existence. They're always held together. Peter held this faith and this doubt all at the same time. Peter and Jesus climb back into the boat and the wind dies down. Another thing that only proves further that Jesus is God. He can control the winds. The disciples finally put all the pieces together. They are beginning to see and believe that Jesus is God, and they worship him in the boat. A little bit of faith transforms the story from a scary ghost story with wind and terror into a story that ends with the breaking of the dawn and worship. So what do you believe? I pray that you can trust in the God who is there in the midst of our storms. I pray that you can take heart in the man that says he is, I am. I pray that you will not be afraid because Jesus hasn't taken his eyes off of you for one second. And I pray that you find yourself in the boat. If you find yourself in the boat, you can look around and you can see that Jesus is right there with you too. Because he is. He always is. Would you pray with me? This prayer is taken from the message version of the Bible, um, from Ephesians 1. I ask the God of our Master Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally, to make your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what it is he is calling you to do, so that you can grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for his followers and the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him, giving us endless energy and boundless strength. Amen. Would you please stand as we share together this Mosley Lister hymn, Till the storm passes by, it's number 543. <laughs>
passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of thy hand keep me safe till the storm passes by many times Satan whispered, there is no need to try, for there's no wind of sorrow, there's no hope by and by, but I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storm never darkens the sky. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. The long night has ended and the storms come no more. Let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In the land where the tempest never comes, Lord, my eye dwell with thee when the storm passes by. The storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Would you continue to remain standing as you join me as we affirm our faith in the saying of the Apostles' Creed? Join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You may be seated. Today, as we prepare our hearts to give in many ways, hear this our call to give. Christ has freely given us the gift of grace and salvation. Let us therefore freely bring our generous gifts, gifts of gratitude to Him. <laughs>
Thank you, Linda. Would you stand and receive the benediction? May the generous blessing in favor of our loving, abundant God lift you, sustain you, and send you into the world with the gift of life. We hope that you know God. We hope that you love God, and we hope that you show God so others may know God as well. May God's grace, peace, and love be with you and yours now and forevermore. Amen. Let's share the first verse of 746. There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear I out with thee, peace be still In a love life's ebb and flow Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweet as name I know Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go.